A PMP certificate can be very valuable in your civil engineering career, but what is it and how can it actually help you? In this episode of the podcast, Jason Dunn, Chief Risk Officer at BRPH, a licensed professional engineer and PMP, is going to explain what the certificate is, how you can go about getting it, and how it's helped him in his engineering career. Let's jump right in. All right, now I'm excited to welcome today's guest to the podcast, Jason Dunn. Jason is the Chief Risk Officer at BRPH. Jason, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to chatting. So, Jason, I'm really excited to talk to you. We're going to dive into a little bit on how the PMP certification has helped you in your career as an engineering professional. Of course, you're a licensed engineer as well as a PMP. Correct. However, before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit about your company and your position at your company, Chief Risk Officer. First of all, tell us a little bit about BRPH and what services your firm provides. Sure, sure. We're a multidiscipline firm, architecture and engineering. Um, so we, we have all disciplines in-house, not just architecture, but we have civil, structural, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, everything you need from, you know, to do a, a project. And we try to keep that in-house. Uh, we are 56 years old and have been doing um, mostly work in the manufacturing, aerospace and defense, uh, commercial entertainment uh, and education market sectors. Those are kind of our base market sectors. And it's um, a good mixture of those uh, to counteract, you know, ups and downs, ebbs and flows of the market conditions. Uh, so it's a good mixture of the markets. And we are spread out uh, all over the U.S. And, and strategic areas really. We're based in Melbourne, Florida, which is right near Cape Canaveral in the Kennedy Space Center. Our first client as a company was NASA, and we still work for NASA today, as well as other uh, space flight companies that are in that region. So we've held our headquarters there. We have a presence in Florida, uh, Melbourne, Orlando, and uh, Boca, and then we have, I'm in our Atlanta office, which is a regional office in Atlanta. And in that area, we have an office in Huntsville and Charleston, South Carolina. And then uh, office, uh, we just opened a new office in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and we have an office in the Seattle region. So and what's the rough right number of people you have? We are right at 350 folks, and it's a pretty even split between architecture and engineering. I'd say it's about 50-50. So wow. it's a good mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. And I know that there are you know, a lot of benefits to having the services in-house together in terms of yep. you know, just effectiveness on project production as well as you know cross marketing and, and business mm -hmm. development so lots lots of good stuff there for sure that's right and, and like i said we try to use our in-house services as much as possible for a client that way we've we do everything essentially turnkey if we can yeah so that worked out great certainly something to think about as a civil engineer if you're listening you know when you think about what firms you're going to work for if you're not out of firm right now mm -hmm. um you know, firms that do have those different disciplines, it's a different, it's kind of a different ball game, I guess is a good way to say it when you're working there. Um, because you're able to be kind of more of an all in one solution for clients. I know I worked at a multidiscipline civil firm. And so, you know, when I would go out on a project site, I'd be able to say, Hey, if you need some geotechnical, you know, soil examination, mm -hmm. done, we can do that. If you need some wetlands investigation done, we can do that. If you need the survey done, we can do that. And so, yep you know, it makes things easier. But Jason, what I, what I also want to talk to you about, you know, when I originally contacted you, you know, we said we were going to focus on talking about the PMP, which we will, mm -hmm. but your title chief risk officer seems like it's a title right now that, you know, <laughs> or a position right now that a lot of firms would want to have someone in. Talk a little bit about your responsibilities with this position. Sure. Um, so we developed this, actually it's fairly new. We decided to go ahead and make it formalized this year. Um, you know, for one, uh, what we do is risky, right? Engineering architecture is risky. Um, there can be bad things that happen when things go wrong. But beyond that, you know, we, my firm, we do engineering design, architecture design, but we also have a construction arm and a separate construction services group that'll do, you know, primarily build, we, we try to leverage that for clients, almost like an extension of service. Uh, so we're not out there bidding huge projects, but we offer that as more as a, like I said, an extension to offer value to clients. So there's, as with construction comes risk. And so what I have, what I've been tasked to do is really identify, assess, and come up with responses, mitigation plans for any risk that I see in those areas, but not just 
architecture, engineering, and construction, but also things like IT. You know, there's obviously IT risk now with ransomware and those sort of things, identifying those, you know, anything from actual legal risk that uh, sometimes those pop up. So I handle those with any disputes with, with our owners, uh, with contractors, uh, even into the mediation areas and things like that, which is necessary to solve those disputes. But I'm looking at it, I've been tasked to look at it from an entire enterprise standpoint of all of our services. And that came from, you know, my prior role as I was hired into BRPH was director of project management, which uh, basically was acting as a PMO officer. I um, created the standards from a project management division and, and enforced those and, you know, make sure we're in compliance the way we plan projects, the way we earn revenue, the way we deal with clients and, and the way we work internally and externally with team members. So it kind of grew from that as, as that kind of developed and matured, you know, I started handling, um, you know, some of the problem projects that would come up from time to time or clients who weren't happy and, and, and talking to those and try to mitigate those issues that kind of led to the chief risk officer role I have now. Wow. And, and I would imagine, I mean, of course, with everything going on with the pandemic, but, yeah. you know, even beyond that, like you said, with construction and, you know, construction litigation and cybersecurity risks, I would imagine that your position, you're pretty busy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've actually, just, it just was formalized uh, this month, but I've been kind of ramping up to it for several months now, especially with the pandemic, it kind of accelerated risk and the need yeah. for risk management as we saw it as a corporation. Yeah. And I would imagine that more firms are going to have positions like this going forward based on this pandemic and sure. some of the other, you know, there's always cybersecurity threats and, and things of that nature, especially as firms grow and there's just more. That's right. And more locations and things of that nature. So that's very interesting. And really, Jason, what what's interesting about your career as, as I hear you speak about it is mm. you've had some positions where you've been able to really kind of help and influence your company in terms of the project management and creating the standards, now getting into the risk stuff. That must be something that's kind of exciting as a professional. It is. Um, if you feel like you can contribute, especially change the way things are being done at the company and, and, in it, and it's a betterment, you know, the way we do things and it allows us a better platform for growth. That's very exciting. And that's been wonderful uh, to be a part of. And that's what I was brought in to do at my current firm, BRPH. Uh, we were, I joined uh, seven years ago and I was brought in to help, um, like I said, just uh, create those project management standards. They didn't have any in place and they were in tremendous growth mode when I joined. Uh, we've do over doubled in size since I've joined seven years ago. So that kind of tells you, gives you a magnitude of what happened. But uh, just to develop those standards and kind of get everybody on the same page, um, a more uniform approach, even across all the multiple markets, uh, has been very helpful uh, to our growth in the last several years. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so let's jump in here and talk a little bit about the Project Management Professional Certification or the PMP. And for those of you not familiar with that certification, it's an internationally recognized professional designation that's offered by the Project Management Institute. And I believe at this point in time, there are about a million active PMP certified individuals um, kind of across the globe. Jason, talk to us about the certification. Um, what made you interested in going after it? Sure. So as I was brought in for that role as director of project management initially, um, started researching a little bit about standards and what makes sense from a design firm versus construction, because there's different kind of project management paths, you know, related to design and construction and, and anything else. So I started researching it and joined PMI at the time and really thought that would be a great uh, learning experience and tool for me to use and utilize across our firm. So I did go through PMI, uh, research different, um, different, learning classes, you know, preparation classes for the PMP. And so that's what I, I looked at. And what I ended up doing was taking a four day, almost crash course uh, training class uh, that's offered by a PMI licensed trainer. And basically it's four days of intense training and learning, uh, basically 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And, and that, that's, that was effective. While it was intense, it did get me away from the office because you were, you know, at a location away from work and you could focus on that. It was four full days straight. And then after that, you were eligible to take uh, the test. Now, some folks recommended taking the test on the Friday because it was Monday through Thursday. 
I would not recommend that because your your brain is overloaded after those four days and you're in, and you need a little break. So what I did was I took I think two weeks to kind of digest the information, uh, relearn it, uh, recalibrate it, and then took the test and it was effective that way. Wow, that's great. And so, so in terms of the application process and the preparation mm -hmm. for it, so you apply for it, you fill out some kind of application for the exam, is that correct? That's correct. It's through PMI.org and you have to show uh, certain years of experience uh, in managing projects. And, uh, you know, at that time when I took it, I had, um, you know, well over 10 years of experience, um, you know, performing management process, actually 20 years. But if they had what they had to do is a pretty intense process for, for application. You had to break it out into what they call the five project management knowledge areas, which is basically the, the process uh, timeline of a project, which would be initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and controlling and closing. So all five of those areas, you had to really segregate your duties and your past experiences of how you interacted in those areas and in, in any stage of the project. So it's a, it's a pretty fairly intense application process uh, to complete. Hmm. Wow. And then, so once you um, were accepted to take the exam, yes, you, you took the week long preparation course, as you mentioned, the four days, mm -hmm. did you, was that something that you took that was like your extent of studying or were you also preparing before that on your own or after that? I was preparing for my, on my own because PMI does offer certain uh, tools and things to, to start reviewing. They have the project management book of knowledge that's available online. So I did start pr to prep, um, but the class was the essential tool. It, it was, they went through each knowledge area in the, you know, in the same procedure that you would um, take the test. And many, you know, they offered many practice tests together as groups uh, in the class itself. So it was very hands-on instruction. Uh, I would definitely recommend that approach rather than say doing a uh, online course on your own because I think it keeps you focused. Right. Being able to get away from things, stay yep. focused on it. And exactly. That's great. That That's, yeah, I can see how that can be <laughs> helpful. Um, and so I was going to ask you kind of how difficult it was to study while you were working, but it sounded like that was the strategy to get around that a little bit was getting yourself out of work. Yep. It really was. And what I did, you know, the next week before the test, um, after work or in the evenings, I would, you know, refresh the material of my, you know, away from, away from the family in a quiet room, just to kind of gather my thoughts. It, it's a lot of material. I will say there's a, there's actually a lot of memorization and, and process order of things, how, how, Things are, you know, prioritized and things you got to do first before you proceed to the next step is in that approach. So it's very comprehensive. But the way it's structured is very scalable to the organization you work in. So I modeled the same approach that PMI uses for our project management standards at BRPH. The same processes, the same knowledge areas, the same timelines. Uh, just scaled back a little bit because uh, there's not everything applies to what we do uh, that PMI enforces. But you know, BMI does it from a global standpoint. Uh, it is scalable to use that to set standards for our design firm or any other firm you, you choose to do so. That's great. And what is the actual exam like? Take us through that. How, how long is it? How does it work? It is a four hour test. Um, and it actually, it, is, it was performed. I don't know how they're doing it now with COVID. It may be virtual, but uh, it's at a secure testing center. So you cannot bring any materials inside. You know, you leave everything in a locker and it's a four hour test, 200 questions, actually all multiple choice. So, um, you know, there are some trick questions involved, you know, they try to trick you up, you know, process wise or terminology wise. So you got to be careful with how you answer it. But um, for half day test at secure locations how it worked. And then what I liked about it, as soon as you hit submit, you knew if you passed or failed right then. You didn't have to wait for a oh, for wow. A, yeah, yeah, that is nice. Yeah, you know, for mail or whatever. So it was great. Instant feedback. So yeah. you talked about how it's impacted you in terms of your company. It's obvious that you've really used that blueprint to help you build the PM standards at BRPH, which which yeah. is great. And I see that that's tangible and very valuable. Mm -hmm. But how has it impacted you personally, like in your career, the way you think, the way you approach things, the whole PMP process? Um, I'm an engineer. And uh, so I'm very methodical, analytical. So it kind of helped me hone those skills a little bit more when it comes to project management and, and anything else related to the PM world, you know, meetings, review sessions with owners, uh, team meetings internally or externally. Um, it kind of made me focus more on the, on the right process to follow. 
um, when it comes to those sort of things. It really helps me to become a little more organized um, and, and procedurally wise. It actually also helped me. I, I perform all the project management training internal at BRPH and have been for a while. We're looking to maybe expand that soon uh, to maybe use outside sources. But it helped me develop a good training program for our new upcoming PMs or new PMs that we hired within the company to kind of train them on the platform uh, to model after our standards. You know, it, it pretty much modeled the PMI platform, but what I would do in the training sessions would show them how it applied to our standards, our tools and templates and things like that with BRPH. That's great. I think this is a really good thing for a firm like yours that's obviously growing and you're trying to mm-hmm. scale the company up to have standards like this, to have guidelines, to have someone there that's really focused on building these guidelines the right way, these PM guidelines is really important. I mean, I think that just in terms of building um, an engineering design you know, consulting firm, yep. that's like one of those key questions. At what point in the firm's timeline do you really dig in and develop you know, your PM guidelines? Yep. And it sounds like, you know, your firm had was really diligent about, you know, identifying someone in yourself that could do this, make mm-hmm. sure you get the right trip. Well, you investigated the training and got the certification and then transferred that into the actual kind of operating procedures of the company. Yep. It, it is essential um, with what we do and our project managers. I mean, we teach them, they're, they're the frontline folks of our firm. So they're interacting directly with clients I mean, they're, they're the ones responsible for winning work and getting the work done. So it makes sense to me to have a strong project management presence and training and, and approach uh, to make that happen because that, they are, you know, our PMs are the lifeline of our organization. Yeah, for sure. And so if we have listeners right now that are listening, Jason, that are civil engineering professionals, they're you yep. know, working in their careers and they're trying to decide, this sounds like an interesting certification. Should I get it? Like, you know, what would your advice be to them? Is there a specific type of work that makes it more sense for you to get it? Or what kind of advice can you throw out there on it? Well, yeah, sure. You know, I started out as a civil engineer um, in the design arena. It was very technical starting out. Um, what what kind of helped me go to that craft? Um, my first firm right out of school, I went to Georgia Tech and, and went to work for a firm here in Atlanta. And that firm offered me very a big variety of different type of projects. You know, I was working on hydrology. I was working on dam rehabilitation projects, working on land development projects, working on resorts, um, a big, you know, big mixture of different type of things. So I would recommend to civil engineers go that route first, learn your technical trade. And then as you develop into more project management, I was early on in my career, after I developed those technical skills, I, uh, was able to make good connections with clients early on. That was something I learned how to do from my first supervisor there. And I started managing clients and started to get into more project management roles, more so than technical. So as that PM track developed for me, um, it became obvious that that became a useful thing. You know, you got to be organized as a project manager. You're the go-to person on a project from the owner standpoint. So you got to be organized. You got to have a methodical process in place. And uh, the PMI, process works. You can, like I said, it's a scalable process. It can be used on small projects. It can be used on large multidiscipline projects. That's great. That's great. So it sounds like from what you're saying and from my own experience, you know, learn the technical trades yes. immediately in your career, go yes. for that PE license, which especially in the civil world is absolutely highly yep. critical and highly important. And then as you start to usually kind of the next step in your career, they'll give you a, your company will give you a project to manage, maybe start with a small project and you'll start to mm-hmm. get into project management. And that's when you may look to couple the PE license with this PMP certificate yes. that could really help you to learn the, the intricacies of project management and the delivery processes. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, for those of you out there, your firm may support you in going after these types of certificates and licenses. So you should definitely, you know, talk to them about it. Talk to your HR department about it. I'm looking at the website right now for PMI.org and we'll link to this in the show notes. And it looks like the exam fee is about $500. And then, you know, you might take a course like Jason recommended or something along those lines. There might be some materials, but 
I think long term in your career, if you're going to be involved in civil infrastructure project management of any any kind, it sounds like this could potentially be a very wise investment for you for sure. And I also think it could open up other opportunities for you. If you work for a smaller firm and you go this route, you can end up getting a position um, like Jason had where you have to actually help in developing the PM standards for your company because of the expertise you've built around doing something like the PMP certificate process. So I think that can all be very valuable. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a short break here. We're going to come back with Jason in a minute and we're going to put him on the civil engineering hot seat, which is just going to pepper him with a few more career related questions. I hope you are enjoying this episode of the civil engineering podcast, which is produced by the engineering management Institute. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for more podcast episodes and for all of our engineering manager 80, 20 shorts videos that we publish weekly where we interview successful engineering managers. Now it's time to jump into our civil engineering hot seat segment. All right, we're back with Jason Dunn, Chief Risk Officer at BRPH, and it's time for the Civil Engineering Hot Seat. Jason, you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Fire away. <laughs> All right, so first question, are there any specific rituals that you practice every day? For example, do you have a specific morning routine or lunchtime routine or just something that you do consistently on a daily mm -hmm. basis that has contributed to your success? Yep, I sure do. Um, it's pretty basic, but it's something I do. And even, you know, even more so now with with the pandemic, you know, we're working at home a lot more. I'm working at home probably 90% of the time. So I make sure, you know, I rise at the same time each day after a good night's sleep. I do a, a breakfast every morning, whether it be something just to get my, you know, engines going. And then I immediately log in to, you know, start looking at emails before the meeting craziness begins. Um, I also keep, and this is old school, I'm going to show it to you. I'm old school. I keep a written to-do list. Wow. Uh, you know, you, you've got the outlooks and all those other things to help you manage yourself. But I keep this pad, and this is my to-do list, and it has everything I need to do from, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm here's my engineering part coming out of me. I segregate it by business pursuits, by corporate duties, by travel, which is, doesn't apply right now, and then project-related things and then personal things. And you know, I've come to use that my whole career, the, 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 the actual written list. And it's so nice when you cross something off, you know, that's a very yeah. good thing to cross yeah, good. off. And I also relook at that at the end of the day before I shut down, just to see if there's anything outstanding or if anything I need to hit first thing the next morning. So a pretty basic ritual. So when you log in your email in the morning to do that, then do you extract items from there and write them down? That I do. If there's anything in, in particular, and I try to get on a little early before the meeting craziness start, the Zoom meetings start, which they start up pretty regularly now. So I try to answer the things that have priority before the folks, you know, maybe seven, seven thirty, something like that, before uh, meetings start to engulf your day. <laughs> and in terms of prioritizing those items that are on that written sheet of paper, you just kind of are able, you scan them and you try to prioritize them, I guess, yourself as you go through yes. them. Is that? Yes. And, and be, you know, having this in front of you each day, you can kind of refresh yourself. What's priority. I have a certain system where I start things or certain circles and things just to, just to keep myself managed. It's just, a, it's just a tool for myself to use. Sure. Yeah. Work. Everyone comes up with their own tools and tricks yep. of the trade that, that you have mm -hmm. to. All right, next question, Jason. What's one book that you recommend to engineers regularly or just one book in general that you found to be extremely helpful in your professional or personal development? Yeah, well, there's a couple I'd like to mention. Um, obviously, one of the classics, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Uh, everyone's probably heard of that. It is a good book and it's good to refer to. I mean, it, it taught me, you know, beyond the technical world of an engineer. It, it taught me how to deal with clients, how to deal with people you know, how to be respectful and genuine with people. And that's really how projects get done. You know, it, it will help you. I'll say that those type of things that you learn in that book will help you when problems arise, when disputes come up and they're going to any project you work in, in, in this career, you know, there's going to be issues that come up. And when you can have those genuine relationships with people and clients, it helps you get through those things a lot easier. So I would recommend that book. The other one for me personally, that helped me, um, is a book called The Introverted Leader by Jennifer Conweiler. Um, it's not, not as well known, but it kind of resonated with me. And there's a lot of project management principles within that book. Um, 
you know, a lot of engineers are introverted. They don't like to go out and, you know, their voice is heard, uh, but they're, they have important things to say. So it, that kind of taught me to be a little more organized uh, in every aspect. And, and, and part of that book references the four P's, right? Preparation, presence, pushing yourself and practice, you know, and I learned early on being prepared or even overly prepared when it comes to meetings or dealing with owners is never going to hurt you. And pushing yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone is the only way that you're going to accelerate your career. So acknowledging that and, and, and purposefully doing that has helped me. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you gave us that. I mean, the Dale Carney book is certainly by all means a classic. In fact, I think out of 150 episodes of this podcast, at least, <laughs> at least 50 people. So at least yeah. a third of them had said that book when I asked that question. But that second book also sounds like it's uh, real valuable for, you know, listen, a lot of engineers, we are introverted yes. and aren't necessarily comfortable being out there. And that sounds like some great tips to be able to help as yes. engineers yes. progress. All right. Another question here, thinking back on the managers that you've had in your career, if you think mm -hmm. about your favorite manager or managers, and you don't have to name names here, but just in general, what made these people your favorites? Sure. I've had, you know, at, being at several firms over my career, I've had very good managers and very bad ones. But uh, my favorite one actually was my first manager, first job I had. Um, he was very patient with me and helped me to really learn the craft. Like I mentioned earlier, but learning those technical skills first, um, being a great engineer from, you know, drainage and grading and pipe design and hydraulics, all those things that you learn as a, as a civil engineer, he helped me craft that, but he was a master at dealing with clients. And he, early on, he would take me to client meetings, you know, as a young, engineer has never been exposed to that sort of thing. And he actually got me into the meetings with him and I was able to watch him deal with clients. He was very calm, very smooth, very patient with them and, and always had answers for them, which is the preparation thing I mentioned earlier. So I learned, kind of learned that craft from him. And actually I followed that manager to another firm later after that first job. Wow. That tells you a lot about the importance of your manager when, you know, saying yes. that you followed him to another place. And, and yes. really, again, another pattern from this podcast in terms of asking that question to people does oftentimes seem to be, you know, great managers are patient and they and they listen, you know, yes. they hear kind of your needs. And so that's certainly something that I think as a listener, you can think about as you, you know, mm -hmm. develop your own managerial skills and philosophy. All right, Jason, I've got one final question for you. We call it the critical career, civil engineering career <laughs> elevator advice question. So sure. if you got into an elevator with a civil engineer and you had about 30 to 40 seconds with him or her and had to give them career advice in that short period of time, what would mm -hmm. it be? So I would tell them, and someone told this to me when I was trying to decide the path. I went into school as an undecided engineer um, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to be. But I did research on civil engineering and, and saw quickly that that is a very wide open field. And so there's a lot of things you can do in the civil engineering field. And I would recommend to, especially a newer engineer, you know, keep an open mind. There's a lots of tracks and things you can do in the civil engineering field. You can go into the hydrology, hydraulics, you can do environmental, you can do transportation, you can do structural, and you can even do construction. Uh, so I would say keep an open mind, look for the variety of things and learn as much as you can early in your career. And you'll, you'll, you'll pick a path that you think will match your interest uh, even more. So I think in civil engineering versus mechanical and, and electrical. That's great. And, and I totally agree. I mean, it's amazing the number of sub disciplines in the world of civil engineering. And yeah. quite frankly, there are new jobs being created in this industry almost on a daily basis with all the new technologies that continue to come to market. Yep. Um, you know, we saw that now, you know, you think about drones now, they're kind of like an old thing. They've been around for a long time, <laughs> That's right. but, I know, but I know several civil engineers that have had to learn implement drone divisions into their company. I mean, that's not something when you, maybe like when I went to school or you went to school, no, they were no. even knew anything about. So the point is, is that, you know, you may be in a civil engineering job right now. You're like, eh, I kind of like my job, but listen, there's probably a million other things you could be doing and maybe doing in the future mm -hmm. just because the breadth of this industry with infrastructure and technology oh, is yeah. continuing to evolve. And it's very, very exciting. So Jason Dunn, Chief Risk Officer at BRPH, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day and visiting with us on the Civil Engineering Podcast. No problem. Thank you, Anthony, for having me on. I appreciate it. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast on YouTube produced by the Engineering Management Institute. We're always looking for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.